Every great thinker throughout the course of human history has had something to say about happiness. This is the question that Jim wanted to answer. What is the best way to dramatize Tucson's plural society for the greatest possible number of Tucsonans? Things are impermanent. Things are constantly changing. Nothing is the same across time. That's one element of the Buddhist belief. We are going to explore these, these issues of how the fact that there is a mediator between us and a company, which is the internet, affects our uh, privacy issues. So I think if we're going to be up in arms about a foreign entity uh, trying to manipulate us, we ought to pay more attention to, to domestic uh, influences as well. All right, so that style of music, again, associated with northern Mexico, the borderlands. But the performer of that particular song is not a person of Mexican descent. It's Beyonce Knowles Carter. About half of us have chosen to share our lives and open up our home to the evolutionary descendants of gray wolves. African-American women's language is not black male speech. Black women have started loving themselves loudly. We all desire to see peace in the world, but if we truly want to end suffering, our work must be grounded in justice. often imagine sexuality as an identity-based word or that it's something about our intimacies. But when we look around, we think about healthcare, when we think about marriage, when we think about public health, these are all places where our sexuality as individuals and as a group get really messy and blurry. My name is Eric Plemons. I'm an associate professor in the School of Anthropology, the University of Arizona, and I am the curator of the Downtown Lecture Series this year. And I often say, as an anthropologist, you always want to study a controversy because that's why you know that something really matters to people. The fingers on the drag can go snap, 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 snap. I'm Harris Kornstein, and I'm an assistant professor of public and applied humanities at the University of Arizona. For the downtown lecture series, I'm looking at drag, and that's something that I've looked at in a couple of different ways. One is to look at the way that drag queens perform their fabulous selves online through social media platforms. I'm interested in the ways that drag performers really trick systems. They like drag makeup and how that can be used to thwart facial recognition. I'll also be talking a bit about my work with Drag Queen Story Hour. It's drag queens, drag kings, drag performers of all kinds, reading books to children in libraries, schools, community centers. Once upon a time. So we really try to use you know, social justice children's literature to, to, you know, invite discussion about sometimes difficult topics in society. I research early California, and so I'm focusing in particular in post-Gold Rush California, a time of great flux and tremendous change. My name is Erica Perez. I'm an associate professor of history here at the University of Arizona. Almost overnight, California multiplied its population, and that led to certain shifts in land use, in political power, but most importantly in social relations between those who had already resided in California and those who were newly entering the region. Because the gold rush tends to bring in much more men than they do women, women are faced with certain limitations. And so my research and the subject of my talk is really examining some of these events that are expressed through legal cases, criminal cases, even in the media, these accounts of seduction, breach of marriage promise cases, rape cases, any number of sex crimes. Well, I think the study of sexuality is a really serious lens from which to evaluate American history. It reveals dimensions of power and asymmetry it reveals racial dynamics, ethnicity, and it also gets us thinking about the fact that there is no monolithic sexual culture in this country, and there never has been. I think that we're in a crisis point uh, since the 
Supreme Court decision in the Dobbs case. My name is Louise Roth. I am a professor of sociology and I study gender law organizations and reproduction. So one important aspect of reproductive justice is ensuring that everyone has access to the reproductive health care that they need. And of course, in the United States, not everyone has access to health care that they need. Another thing that I really want people to understand is that outlawing abortion doesn't just outlaw abortion. It has echo effects in other aspects of women's reproductive health care, like how to manage miscarriage, because healthcare providers feel that under the current, in the current legal situation, they cannot provide the care that those women really need when they're having a miscarriage. If you don't give women the right to terminate their pregnancy, there's a good chance you're also not giving them the right to make informed decisions about what is gonna to happen to them when they give birth. Everybody has a sexuality and everybody has a gender. Everybody, it's just, whose do we get to talk about? I work with teachers and in communities to look at the ways in which we can make schools not just safer for LGBTQ youth, but spaces where they can thrive. My name is Carol Brochin, and I'm an associate professor in the College of Education in the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Social Cultural Studies. In my talk, I'll give examples of stories from youth that I've met about what really transformative classrooms have looked like for them. I'll share some stories from teachers who have taken risks and shown up for LGBTQ youth in ways that I think other people can learn from. I believe in the power of stories to build collectives, and I hope that I can inspire some people to think about our communities in ways that, that they can learn to care for them and show up for them. What makes the, the approaches taken by social scientists unique and engaging is that we put people at the center of the conversation. So it's not about making a point, but instead, what are the concerns, what are the issues that are helping to shape this reality, the way that we're living it? And better understanding each of those things help us better understand the problem. Hi everybody, good evening. My name is Lori Plony Staudinger and I am the Dean of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Arizona, the People College. I'm very pleased to welcome you live and on stage to our 10th annual downtown lecture series. This year's series focuses on sexualities and is curated by anthropologist Eric Plemons. Last week we explored the cultural impacts of drag performances Tonight, we will delve into 19th century sex scandals. And in the coming weeks, we will examine reproductive justice and how gender and sexuality are taught or not taught in our schools. Before we get started this evening, I have a few thank yous. First, to our series sponsor, Rick and Bill Small and the Stonewall Fund at the Community Foundation for Southern Arizona. Since its formation over 45 years ago, the Stonewall Foundation has given nearly $50 million to the Tucson community. Founded in 1972, the Stonewall Foundation initially funded 10 nonprofit organizations in Tucson and in Southern Arizona. That expanded to nearly 20 by the time the foundation was turned into a donor fund at the Community Foundation for Southern Arizona. In that time, the foundation was able to provide emergency funding to many organizations that it had annually funded and also provide special COVID funding, which allowed several of these organizations to remain viable during the pandemic. As a donor advised fund at the Community Foundation for Southern Arizona, the advisors of the fund continue to support the same organizations as before 
and add several others to the annual mix of recipients, such as the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. Annual funding from the Stonewall Fund Foundation totals approximately $700,000 per year. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Special thanks as well to our community sponsors, Joanne Ellison and Dr. Barbara Starrett, who have supported the downtown lecture series since its inception in 2013. And finally, thanks to our media sponsor, Tucson Lifestyle. Can you please join me in giving all of our sponsors a round of applause? It is now my pleasure to introduce to you our lecturer for tonight, Dr. Erica Perez. Dr. Perez is an associate professor in the Department of History in the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. She is the author of Colonial Intimacies, Interethnic Kinship, Sexuality, and Marriage in Southern California, 1769 to 1885. And she is currently working on a second book project on multiracial, multi-ethnic history of sexuality, gender, and law in 19th century California. In tonight's talk, Dr. Perez will discuss her ongoing research on sex scandals and sex crimes in 19th century California, focusing on a few legal, specific legal cases and newspaper accounts to illustrate popular debates and societal anxiety about female sexuality, courtship, and the absence of patriarchal protection. Dr. Perez will also examine what lessons we might draw by studying historical as well as more recent cases of sex crimes, sex scandals, and abuse. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Erica Perez to the stage. Dr. Dean Poloni Stadinger, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'd like to take a moment to just offer a word of gratitude and acknowledgement to the fact that we are on the homelands of the sovereign nations of the Pascuayaki and Tohono O'odham nations, and so I say thank you to them. I want to open up my talk tonight with the story of a Los Angeles County court case about a girl named Jessie Marshall who was a 16-year-old white immigrant girl from Nova Scotia, Canada. She was a working class girl making her way in California. And she encountered a man by the name of Jacob Taylor in the course of her work as a waitress. And eventually, her encounter would result in a trial for seduction and breach of marriage promise. Now, Jacob Taylor was an important figure in her life because he was also her employer. And that shaped the power dynamic in which this relationship played out. And it was on one Saturday evening in October 1888 when she received Jacob Taylor's visit. And this had not been the first time he had visited her. She lived at a cottage in close proximity to where she worked. But she had had very friendly interactions with Jacob before that. He had lent her some books. They had engaged in friendly conversation over many different um, days and evenings. And so she had no reason to fear for her safety or her virtue when he showed up on this one fateful night. But on this night, as the LA Herald's trial coverage would note, Jacob Taylor decided to bring with him some wine. And he offered this wine to Jesse Marshall. He himself decided he didn't want to drink the wine. He didn't like it, he said. But he encouraged her to drink it all the same. And she did. And she remembers feeling immediately sick and was unable to stand up by herself. And this was something that, of course, led to him taking her to the bed and other events would unfold. Now, Jacob Taylor took advantage of Jesse Marshall's situation as a working class girl from Nova Scotia. He knew that she had moved to the United States with her mother because her mother had been left impoverished by Jesse's father's death. And so it was on this fateful evening that a relationship, if you want to call it that, would begin. And so Jesse Marshall would become 
pregnant by this relationship with her employer. And she would sue him and seek extensive thousands of dollars in damages. And so what unfolds in this trial is a lot of he said, she said, and character assassination, especially on the part of Jacob Taylor. Entered into evidence are 36 letters that Jesse Marshall had saved during the course of their relationship. These letters had been signed by someone else's name. Jacob Taylor was very careful not to sign his own name in case the letters fell into the wrong hands. But he used a go-between, an associate of his, to give those letters to Jesse, as well as occasional funds for her benefit. And in those letters and in his conversations with Jesse Marshall, you know, he makes clear he's pursuing a relationship with her. Um, this is an employer pursuing a relationship with his 16-year-old waitress employee. But what he also references in these letters is how he promises he will marry her as soon as he fixes his domestic situation. And that situation specifically is the fact that he's already married. And so the relationship continues with the two sneaking around. And as I said, eventually she becomes pregnant. And during the course of that pregnancy, she recalls being ill at one point. And the associate of Jacob's pushed a, a document in front of her and encouraged her to sign it. And in her state, she recalled in her testimony, I didn't really even know what I was signing. But she signed it, and she didn't realize until later that what she was signing was a document declaring or naming another man as the father of her child. And so no surprise, Jacob starts talking to her and contacting her after that has been signed. Now the defense, Jacob Taylor's defense, is going to pursue the strategy of attacking her character, claiming she was not a chaste and virtuous girl. Because under the statute of California, chastity is a key component in any claim for seduction. You cannot have had prior intimate relations with someone and be able to bring forward a claim for seduction. So it's pivotal that if you're going to mount a defense, that's one mechanism in which to undermine the claim is to attack whether or not, or you know, cast doubts on whether or not the girl, the woman in question, was indeed chaste and virtuous. Apologies. And the defense also disputed whether or not the baby was Jacob's. A little girl by the name of Bessie, by the way. And Bessie was brought into court during the trial um, to great acclaim in the press and by the jurors and the judge. What Jacob Taylor alleged was that Jesse told him that the baby was her stepbrother's child. And so he's using the strategy of not only casting doubt on her chastity, but also implying that she had committed incest with her stepbrother. So he's going quite far to try to tear her down. And bear in mind that under the law, juries can take that into account when the defense strategy entails character assassination and casting even more levels of harm and damage to the person's reputation. And the jury does take that into account in the end. But what also undermines Jacob Taylor's credibility is evidence of him meeting Jesse Marshall in Arizona for an assignation that he then later tried to explain away and said, oh, it was such a coincidence that I happened to meet her at the train depot in Phoenix. And wow, I was really surprised to run into her in that hotel in Arizona. And of course, the jury did not believe him. And there were even some questions as to whether or not, with the assistance of Jacob Taylor's associate, whether or not Jesse Marshall had been kidnapped and trafficked across state lines. Now, it's lucky for Jacob Taylor that there wasn't a federal act known as the Mann Act that prohibited sex trafficking or trafficking women across state lines for immoral purposes. He's very lucky that that didn't exist at this point. But the question was raised during the trial. Now, ultimately, Jesse Marshall prevailed. The jury believed her. They sympathized with her. The press often depicted her as this, you know, little white immigrant girl all alone in the world. But in fact, she had a mother in California, and she also had a stepfather who also testified at the trial. But it's interesting to see how the media could really create an image of a vulnerable woman or girl, the image of a victim. 
and that that could play a role in the outcome. And so the judgment was for $25,000. Jacob, like many defendants at this time, appealed to the state Supreme Court. And the justices debated whether or not Jesse was even conscious during that initial encounter. They weighed whether or not additional charges of rape could even be brought against Jacob Taylor because she had been unconscious from the wine. And they relied on the lower court's testimony where she stated, um, I scarcely recollect anything. I asked him to go away. He put his hand under my dress and then I remember pain. And that reference to pain is very important because, of course, it is meant to signal to the listener, to the jury, to the judge, that she had been a virgin at the time of that initial encounter. And so, ultimately, the justices believed Jesse Marshall. And they also had some questions as to whether or not she was at any way, in any way culpable or responsible for her own downfall. And they agreed that the power dynamic was so imbalanced here that Jacob Taylor, a much wealthier, worldly man, really held the power in this situation. But there was some interesting discourse within that Supreme Court opinion. They suggest that some women actually would be liable and culpable in their own downfall, especially women who were more mature and more worldly. And they suggest that perhaps men like Jacob Taylor might even be victims because of his wealth, because there would be women who were manipulative and scheming and wanting to trap him. And this is a theme that I'll revisit, you know, one or two more times in some of the other cases that I'm going to address. And so when we're talking about cases of seduction, these are very gendered laws. A male cannot make a claim of seduction for one thing, it's a female under the law who can make a claim for seduction. And the seducer had to have employed some sort of influence, promise, some sort of artifice, some sort of means to in induce a woman to surrender her chastity. And ultimately, the lower court jury and the California Supreme Court justices agreed that this is what they believed happened to Jesse Marshall. Now, Jesse Marshall was a fighter. And Jacob Taylor tried to escape responsibility for that heavy judgment that was imposed upon him. And she kept suing him, trying to recover those damages. And we might also wonder what happened to her after this trial. Well, she was able to marry and enter what would be considered a respectable life for this time period for a young woman. But it's really notable to think about these kinds of cases because they reveal these different ideas about female sexuality, about whether they are protected, whether they are vulnerable, to what degree do they play a role in what happens to them, and also these kinds of shifts in the society that are taking place. You know, you have a hotel, you have urbanization, you have all these newcomers in California, and there's going to be conflicts that arise as a consequence. So what is the world that Jesse Marshall and others before her enter when they, when they immigrate to California or they move to California from within the United States? Well, we know that beginning in 1848, that is the end of the U.S.-Mexico War. That is the year that the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is signed, ending the war. It bestows U.S. citizenship on Mexican peoples who live in the present day Southwest. And we're gonna see also a few months after that signing of that treaty, gold is discovered in Northern California in Sutter's Mill and in that region. And soon word explodes across the globe of a gold rush in California. And so in the winter of 1848 to early 1849, you know, there's, there's advertisements, there's all kinds of publicity about the discovery of gold and the world explodes overnight in California. You're gonna see a huge population influx, so much so that between 1850 to 1860, there is a good 310% increase in the population. So imagine that as a local, seeing all these newcomers, these foreigners, their, their different cultural ways, the many languages and faiths that accompany these newcomers. And we also know that California enters the Union as a free state in 1850. And that too is going to shape the futures and the fates of certain groups of women who I'll talk about in a minute. 
And this image that we see here, you'll notice the woman in the mining fields. Now, the image of the lone individual gold miner panning for gold is really a myth. It's much more common for groups to band together, share the labor, pool their resources, and eventually there's going to be you know, intensely capitalized mining enterprises in California that displace these smaller groups of people. But women who enter the California gold rush era are going to take advantage of those mining opportunities in mining towns. They are going to sometimes sell food to the miners because the men who are you know, trying to find gold in California don't want to cook for themselves. And so a woman could make some decent money, earn a little bit of a living by making biscuits or tortillas and frijoles and you know, selling them to the miners. And women are also making a living in California by working in mining towns, either in saloons, as barmaids, as sex workers, as um, boarding house keepers, and they're doing whatever they can to earn a living and take advantage of the new golden dream that awaits them. And still other women are going to enter the state trying to become teachers or governesses, you know, and maybe find a husband while they're at it. And I should add that in this period, um, there is a newspaper based out of San Francisco called the Matrimonial News. And it is a newspaper intended to place ads to search for a spouse. Because there were so few women in California at this point, marriage eligible women, that the newcomer men wanted to find a bride, to find a companion. So you'll see these interesting advertisements placed in the matrimonial news. And I liken them to online dating ads because you never know what you're going to get at the other end of that correspondence. There's certainly exaggerations about wealth, exaggerations about one's age, exaggerations about one's looks. And so you'll see that in some of these matrimonial news advertisements. But what these ads also suggest is how desired women were in California. Because the sex ratios were so uneven. There were so many more men than women. And so women faced some greater options in terms of the marriage landscape than maybe they would have in their home country or hometown. And so women such as this Californiana, this Spanish-Mexican woman, we call Spanish-Mexican settlers Californios. It's a regional identification. And the woman in this ambrotype was one of those Californianas who witnessed the world just you know, pull into her home country. And women like her are seeing her family become dispossessed of their land through squatters, through shady deals with attorneys, through predatory loans with newcomers. And Californios are slowly but surely losing their lands in Southern California and even more quickly in Northern California in gold country. They are being literally killed or pushed off by squatters. And so there's a lot of change for women such as this woman here in the picture. But she also might benefit from that expanded marriage option. She now can choose from people other than her countrymen. But there are certain benefits and dangers to that. The benefit is, of course, that if you have an Anglo-American husband who speaks English and knows the legal system, he can help your family. He can help you. On the other hand, some of these guys come into the state professing that they're upwardly mobile, that they are better off than they actually are, and they want to take advantage of women such as this who maybe come from landed families. And we're going to see a clash in understandings of courtship and gender roles for husbands and wives. So if you're an Anglo-American man, you're accustomed to your wife, your intended. Um, if she has property, if she earns wages, that's all going to go to you as a husband. You control it. But under Spanish-Mexican tradition, women can keep, keep their land and their whatever inheritance they may have had. They take that with them into their marriage, and they are able to maintain it in their own name. And so if you have these newcomer men with this expectation that they could be very patriarchal and claim authority over their, their wives, their Spanish-Mexican wives, they're in for a shock. Because these women are not going to take that passively, right? And we see a number of cases, whether it's domestic violence cases, divorce cases. This is also another shift that happens in terms of gender relations and sexuality. We know that absolute divorce is introduced for the first time in California because of that transition to U.S. rule. 
Before that, the people of the region who were Catholics could not have an absolute divorce. You can separate, but you couldn't get legally divorced. But now this is an option for women like this, who may find themselves on the wrong end of a predatory husband. And women are going to come in, as I said, pursuing any opportunity to make a living. We know that there are sex workers coming in from Chile, from France, from many parts of the globe, following mineral rushes wherever they can. And they enter the mining region and will enjoy their lives if they can, but otherwise just try to maybe make some money and move on. But as you can imagine, the life of a sex worker was really hard. Um, their lifespan could be very curtailed. And I like this image because this watercolor is called spending it. And this is in the gold country, right? And you see a number of figures that are, you know, typical figures of the gold region. You see a man in a poncho who is supposed to signify he's maybe Chilean or a Sonoran gold miner. You see a frontiersman in the buckskin. You see some other miners in the background, but you also see the dandy in the front with the top hat and the long coat. And as you can tell by the woman's dress and the fact that her arms are bare, her chest is exposed, and they are having a toast, enjoying whatever wealth they may have you know, benefited from the gold country, they're enjoying, they're splurging, right? That's, that's why it's called spending it. But we can only imagine what arrangements these two may have for later on that evening. And so again, this is the world that women are entering, some opportunities, some limitations in what they can and cannot do. And we know that women of color in particular are going to face certain hurdles and barriers that are different than say Anglo-American or Euro-American women. So for example, this woman here, an unknown Chinese woman, is most likely the wife of a merchant, of a Chinese merchant. Chinese women immigrate into California beginning with the gold rush and they are accompanying their husbands who may be merchants. Others might be domestic servants to those merchant families, but still even more are unfortunately being trafficked in as sex workers from the Guangdong province of China, which had witnessed severe economic um, dislocation at that time. There was a lot of poverty going on in that agricultural region. And some of these young Chinese women and girls may have been aware of why they were coming to California. They would have felt it was their filial duty to obey and help their families, but others thought that they were being brought in to work as perhaps domestics. And so one of the challenges in trying to find Chinese experiences is that Chinese women don't show up in the historical records as often as other groups of women. For one thing, there's a language barrier for Chinese women. It's hard for them to bring lawsuits or, you know, lodge complaints for sex crimes or attacks on their person. Um, and so it's really hard to find some of their experiences, but they are definitely there. But I say this as a way of prefacing why there are certain groups that show up in my presentation a little bit more than others. Um, we know that among the Chinese community, the sex ratio is so imbalanced that it ranges from 12 men to one woman or 14 men to one woman for most of the 19th century. And so that makes it very hard to form families. And we also know that it, Chinese people are the prime targets of some of the first you know, federal legislation that specifies a group, a particular group. So some of you may be familiar with the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. But before that was the 1875 Page Law, which targeted women Chinese women in particular who were believed to be trafficked in for immoral purposes. And this reveals anxiety and concern about interracial contact, interracial sex, you know, the presence of Chinese community being able to reproduce and continue in the United States. And so, you know, the struggles for certain groups of women are going to be increased compared to others. And the Spanish-speaking population, as I said, they're going to become a minority almost overnight. And nevertheless, they're going to adhere to their Spanish, Mexican, Catholic traditions to the best they can. But they are facing a Protestant majority in California very soon after statehood. They're going to rely on churches as a source of sustenance. And here you see a congregation from Mission San Juan Capistrano. I don't know if you could see, but the bishop is in the far right background there. Um, and so, you know, this is obviously a celebratory event. But we're seeing that 
um, California is a place of great religious diversity, not just on nationality or ethnicity, but religion as well. You have so many different faiths being practiced in the state. And in fact, LA becomes a particular place where interdenominational cooperation takes place. You see the establishment of orphan asylums, Magdalene societies, other kinds of philanthropic groups that are often bringing in folks from different faith groups in cooperation with one another to try to improve the quality of society. And so for every um, conflict that we might see along interracial lines or racial lines, um, you also see some level of cooperation going on. And this brings me to African American women. I wanna introduce you to Mrs. Biddy Mason. Mrs. Biddy Mason is one of many African American women who are brought into the state, usually by their enslavers. And she is one example of this. She was the bondswoman of a couple in Mississippi who became Mormon converts. They went to Salt Lake City, and then from there they decided to migrate to San Bernardino where there was a Mormon colony. And they took a gamble because they were told that California was a free state, but they thought somehow Mrs. Biddy Mason wouldn't figure that out. And she was able to build some good alliances and find good allies within the larger community among you know, white Californians, Californios, as well as free black people who were in the state. And they helped her to sue for her freedom. Now this is rare because under the state constitution of California, African Americans cannot initiate complaints in their own name. In other words, if the evidence solely relies on African American witnesses, you cannot lodge a complaint according to the state constitution. And this would be in place from 1850 to 1863, this inability to use the justice system to full effect. And this is one of the reasons why we probably do not see more women, African American women, in the legal courts and in the historical record. But nevertheless, she was able to find some white allies who could help corroborate her story. And so as long as you have white witnesses to help corroborate your claims, you can go ahead with the suit. And she prevailed in that suit. And in doing so, she was able to free many of her extended kin along the way. Mrs. Biddy Mason was known for being an excellent midwife, a nurse, and she squirreled away every penny she had, and she put that to philanthropic use. I consider her the mother of the African American community in California. She helped to establish one of the first elementary schools for black children, and she also co-founded the AME Church in Southern California, one of the first African American congregations. And so she left a legacy upon which others would build on. But I say this again to explain why some women are going to show up in these court cases and others less so. And the same is true for Native American women. That same California constitution prohibited Indian peoples from initiating complaints and lawsuits in their own name as their own witnesses uh, from 1850 to 1872. And so these young girls who are Yuma, peoples, Ketchan peoples from southwestern California and southeastern Arizona are going to be hyper visible in society as native women. They are indeed subjected to constant violence in Gold Rush, California. And they're also subjected to constant interference by new waves of missionaries. These groups had already sustained missionary interference under the Spanish period, and now with US rule, you're going to see new Protestant groups also trying to missionize and reform their sexual practices, reform the ways in which they dressed, reform the ways in which they understood their marriage practices. And so these girls are part of a group that are attending an Indian boarding school or day schools in the area of Southern California. And what's very common is to find these little ethnic enclaves in California where different communities lived and resided, but Chinatowns become singled out as places associated with vice. Uh, fair or not, uh, Chinatowns become branded as vice havens. And so here you have a Chinatown in Los Angeles. There will be Chinatowns established in Marysville, California, in San Francisco, you know, in different parts of the state. Again, reflecting the ongoing immigration of Chinese people into the region. And this is a procession that's going on. But what thing, one thing you will notice is there are no women in the streets. You'll see some children in the background, but there's no women. 
because the streets are the domain of men. If you walk the streets of any city in California, you run the risk of street harassment or even attack. And so what does that say for those working class girls like a Jesse Marshall and others who are just trying to earn a living, trying to get to work? We know that life is tough for them. And on the one hand, they're highly desired and sought after for companionship, sexual companionship or as wives. But on the other hand, their class status makes them particularly vulnerable. And the same is true here. And so here, I want to begin our next couple of cases with an image of the Los Angeles courthouse founded in 1888. And it is within these halls that women like Jesse Marshall are going to testify to being seduced by men, by predatory men. It is within these halls that women are going to talk about being victimized and subjected to rape and have to disclose the most intimate details of their lives, sometimes to hostile juries and judges. And so women would enter the halls of justice seeking to hold accountable those rakes, those seducers, those rapists that had targeted them. And it was also in the courthouse as well as newspapers where ideas about courtship, premarital sex, and sexual cultures is going to circulate, be inscribed, and be distributed in the minds of the people listening. And so I want to pivot now to another case. This is another seduction under breach of marriage promise. This is, again, another L.A. County case involving a woman by the name of Josefa Valenzuela, who was about 33 years old at the time that she was allegedly seduced by a man named Segundo Higuerra. Now, these parties are both Spanish speakers. They're both Californios. Josefa is a working class woman, though, and so she's often described as Mexican because of her class. Whereas Secondino Iguerra is known to come from a very prominent Californio family that owned land. So he's considered a Spanish scion in the press. Right? And you could see how class can shape the ways in which the press depict certain figures in these stories. Now, Josefa was a 33-year-old domestic, and that is how she came into contact with Segundo. She was working at his ranch house as a domestic, and he started to make his intentions and affections known to her. And so this is how they met, and this is how things would unfold. And the press depicted Josefa as a victim trapped by the insidious wiles of a naughty man. That's a quote. Um, and so they, you know, in some instances depicted her as a victim, but in other instances they made a lot of her age. They kind of poked at her about her age. They would call her a maiden, for example, because she was 33 years old and hadn't been married yet. Um, in the course of the trial, which was standing room only, by the way, uh, Josefa, who was described as dark-eyed but fair complexion, had to recount the moment of her seduction and the relationship that followed between herself and her employer. And so she does so, and you could tell in the press by the way that they describe it, she's very uncomfortable, very reluctant to disclose these personal details, but she does so anyway. And one of her former romantic love interests was introduced as a witness, a man by the name of Frederico Samuel, who was a Spanish speaker. So there were interpreters at play in this trial. And the crowd in the gallery kind of lean in, hoping that he's going to spill some juicy details about his relationship with Josefa, that he's going to reveal that she had not been virtuous and chaste. But he didn't do that. He defended her honor. He was adamant that she was a virtuous woman. And the press, you know, their coverage, they came away admiring him for his manliness, for doing what was right instead of taking an opportunity to seek revenge. And Josefa also wanted to make the point in her testimony that she had had other love interests. So it's not as if she was some, you know, unknowing woman who misread the situation with her employer. So clearly she felt like she understood where where his intentions rested and she believed him when he promised that he would marry her when he said that he loved her. Now he denied, Secundino denies, you know, ever promising marriage. But what ends up happening is during the course of the trial, the assistant DA, like things take a real sensationalistic moment in the trial when after Secundino Iguerra says, no, 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 I was never intimate with her, I didn't seduce her. Um, 
the assistant DA says, okay, well then show us what happened. Like give us a physical demonstration of what happened. And you can imagine the judge was not keen to let that go. The judge said, if the combined wealth of the English and Spanish language does not allow us sufficient knowledge to convey what happened, we're, we're gonna quit right here. We're not gonna do this, right? But it shows like how these trials can become mass spectacles, right? Things that the gallery and the spectators and the audience, like it, it is like watching a show. It is a soap opera for some of the spectators, even though we know that these are real people's lives. On his part, for his defense strategy, Secundino Iguerra brings his brother onto the stand. And the brother says, actually, I'm the one who had intimate relations with Josefa, and she was not chaste. She was not a virtuous woman. So this is a way in which he's, they're trying to undercut the claims of Josefa. And this was quite a scandalous bit of testimony. But then the assistant DA brought up the, second, the Higuera brothers' notorious and scandalous past with women before this, that they had a reputation for loving them and leaving them, in other words. And so this is brought up into trial. And this goes to show how your associations, your social network, can also play a role in how your respectability and your character is assessed in these cases. On the part of Josefa, her sisters, the Valenzuela sisters, are brought in in terms of their, their own pattern of behavior. It is noted that her sisters were known to have had premarital sex and that one of them bore a child from such an encounter. And so in doing that, the defense is trying to paint a picture that Josefa and all of those in her family are somehow promiscuous, right? That they're not chaste and virtuous people, they lack respectability. Now ultimately, in this 1897 trial, Secundino Iguerra is found guilty. And you can see the way in which his status as a Spanish scion is bumped down in the eyes of the press to a Mexican mess. He has now become a Mexican instead of a Spanish scion because of this trial. And I think the case is really useful for getting us to think about premarital sex and courtship because not everybody had the same visions or op opinions as to the role of premarital sex and courtship. Your class status matters, right? If, if the family honor is tied to a woman's chastity and virtue, that's gonna be much more important to wealthier families than perhaps those who are working class people who may have a little bit more freedom and acceptance of, of these kinds of relationships before marriage. And so, again, these can be really useful cases uh, to get us to think about sexual relations, understanding of courtship and marriage. Now, it's not only you know, California Spanish speakers, but French speakers, too, are brought into court and initiating their own lawsuits. In this case, we know that Jean Elisipesh is bringing a case against Miguel Samonset, her you know, partner, her fiance. Um, Things are really gonna get ugly between this couple <laughs> very quickly. They are a French Basque couple, and the case shows the French Basque community plays a very important role as witnesses, as support system. You can see that in the trial transcripts and in the newspaper coverage. Now, Jeanne had been a working class girl. She was working at a boarding house known as the Buena Vista House. And this was ran by her sister, Mrs. Laurent. Now, at the time that this case played out, I should also mention that the census for California indicated in 1890 that about 51% of Californians spoke English as the primary language, but the rest spoke some other language. So again, there's so much ethnic diversity going on here in California that also shapes these different understandings about what is appropriate and what is respectable. Now, in working at the Buena Vista House, one of the things you should know as well is that boarding houses can be a means of support for widows, for, for families. They're trying to emulate a middle, that's the houses are fronts as body houses, of houses as body houses, of houses of ill repute, as brothels. And so there's a little bit of quotation of Buena Vista House, and he said, it is bad. It's well known for being a notorious place. And so what that then by extension suggests is that fiance, Miguel, who is a Basque sheep herder, and sheep herding is a very common occupation for the 
in November. And then individuals are pending, but all of us, so you can see the kind of character assassination that comes into play when you have these kinds of cases. And so Jean, once again, had to recount the indignity of testifying about her sexual, her first time with Miguel. And she was asked under oath if she was positive, never in my life had I done anything of the kind. And I did this because he made me believe that I would be his wife and he would be my husband. And she denied ever being engaged before. She denied ever having intimate relations with anyone else before. And ultimately, the California Supreme Court affirmed the verdict. And, you know, they supported Jean, in fact, right? But Jean decided, no, that's not good enough. And so she sues Miguel and the witnesses see to damage her reputation. And she wins a verdict for $1,000 in that case. And she is paid the $1,000 by Miguel Sanonset. And so again, we see these men who are going to use the strategy, the defense strategy of character assassination of you know, their former fiancés or their former lovers. Um, and that could have dire consequences for them because juries can assess that in awarding damages, whether they think that the man in question was knowingly besmirching the reputation of a woman, knowing that he was guilty. For example, rape cases. And so I want to mention one case in particular. This of the parties being of the same culture group or ethnic group, this is an interracial rape case. And this and she had accused a, a man, an Anglo man by the name of D.A. Ross, who was a businessman out of San Pedro. Of and witnesses were asked to recall in detail what Eloida told them. And, you know, goal on the part of the defense was to say, oh, did she? and the fact that she also had a father figure, Eloida had a stepfather who testified in this trial and, you know, talked about what he learned events that transpired between his stepdaughter and D.A. Ross. But on defense, they claimed that the stepfather was trying to extort money out of D.A. Ross because the stepfather had demanded some sort of settlement. Now, from the stepfather's perspective and his explanation, my stepdaughter just endured a rape. She became pregnant from that rape. I wanted some settlement so we can avoid a court case, avoid the scandal, and also give her the means to support her child. 93 rape trial. And the LA Herald notably called Eloida a child mother, and provision, and that they were lacking respect. In a moment of restraint, the judge says, no, we're not gonna continue with this line of questioning, but the seed had been planted in the minds of Benton. So the stakes are quite also Historians have demonstrated various studies of Clinton prisoners' lists. Anglo men are rarely, men are rarely tried, let alone convicted of rape. And there tends to be a lot of leniency extended to them when they are. And we need, among the other things that was asked in this case was the timing of Luida's child's born a little bit. question has found to advise you to acquit. This is before they've even gone into deliberations. They haven't had jury instructions yet, nothing. He outright says this during the trial. Uh, he says, quote, it would not do for a woman to claim that a man right with her. So now he's a child mother. She's a woman, an adult woman in the, in the eyes of the judge. And the judge really altered the complexion of the case and the trial and about Eloida and her own future. Right? She is just this little Mexican girl who tried to claim rape against a prom phenomena of child brides, right? And there is long history of child brides in this country. And very often judges um, or, you know, the authorities are not going to do anything to overturn a marriage between a much older man and an underage minor, especially if it's been consummated. And so... I like this picture because I think it gives us a useful illustration of what I mean by a child bride. This is a Mexican girl out of Los Angeles around 1910. I thought this was her holy communion picture when I first saw it, but it is her wedding picture. 
And so when we're thinking about how young some of these girls were when they married, um, there are just so many accounts of young girls like this being kidnapped by older men and then eloping with them under their influence and this concern about child brides. And so one of the questions that we might ask ourselves is at what age are adolescents equipped to consent to sex or marriage? And these are debates that are ongoing in California by the 1890s as there are age of consent law debates taking shape. And I think the ideas of childhood are also in transition as well. And so for that reason, we have this final scandal of a man by the name of Frank Morse who gets attacked by what is described as a mob in the streets of South San Francisco in 1893 on this one autumn day. Now Frank Morse had a notorious reputation by this point. He had been a boarder of a French family, the Marquettes, that was headed by Jacques Marquette, his wife, and his little daughter, Lulu, who was described in the press accounts as little barefooted Lulu. And Frank Morse had been a boarder of the family. They ran a laundry business. And Mr. Marquette noticed some strange interactions between his daughter, Lulu, and Frank Morse. And so he confronts Frank Morse about this. And Frank Morse, who is well over six foot tall and 32 years old, declares his love to prevent enticing houses of ill fame, like they're trying to prevent brothels and body houses. And Ordinance 57 is trying to eliminate profanity from public streets, right? Good luck with that. Um, and then you have like another ordinance in Sacramento that I'm pretty fond of. It's Ordinance 91. It's passed in 1868. And this is an ordinance that prohibits women from staying out in drinking establishments past midnight. I would have definitely been fined probably for one of those ordinances. The up staying out for a beer past midnight, perhaps. Um, and this is targeting women in particular. It's targeting female persons, it says. And the goal of that is to prevent women from perhaps staying in saloons and drinking establishments to then ply the sex trade. And so there's a Supreme Court challenge at the California state level to that ordinance that the women who tried to sue for their constitutional rights unfortunately lose. Um, but you can see the ways in which these municipal ordinances reveal anxieties and efforts to try to regulate and just get everybody to behave, right? Um, but there's a level of tolerance for vice. In Santa Barbara in 1888, a woman by the name of Lottie Tyler, who was known to be a madam of a brothel, was brought up on charges for keeping a house of ill fame. A month prior to her being tried, there had been an ordinance passed that prevented houses of ill fame or body houses from existing within a certain hundred number of yards, like 300 yards of a schoolhouse, right? And then she gets tried. It took the jury 10 minutes to acquit her. So we can only wonder who was on the jury? Were they possible patrons of her establishment? We don't know. But it is an indication that these things are contested. Not everybody agrees to this regulation of morality. Not everybody agrees that sexual culture is monolithic, is one thing, right? And so what does the past tell us about present times? How can we think about past scandals, events, and use that lens to think about the present? And so I wanna bring up one notable scandal involving former California governor and Hollywood action star Arnold Schwarzenegger, who in 2011, a day after he had completed his term in office as governor, the public leaked the fact that he had a child by his housekeeper of 20 years, who was a Guatemalan immigrant woman by the name of Mildred Patricia Pati Faena, and that they had what was described as a love child, a boy by the name of Joseph. And within days of Pati delivering her son, Maria Shriver, the journalist and wife of Arnold Schwarzenegger, gave birth to their son, right? And so the press, the way that they treated this is, this is just another Hollywood scandal. It's just another Hollywood scandal. What is not considered is the coercive, the potentially coercive aspect of a wealthy employer over an immigrant woman who is the domestic worker. That's not really considered in the coverage of the media. And this is not unlike what I'm seeing with some of my cases. 
because they're often framed as these, you know, love affairs gone wrong. But they don't pay enough attention to the fact that the, the livelihood of these working class women depends on these men who pursue them. Right? And so, um, again, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about past and present. Although historians are reluctant to draw too close of an analogy, right? Conditions change, factors change. You can't say this is exactly the same. But we see echoes of the past and the present. So I want to conclude with my last, um, my last example. That is, of course, the famous Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial that was heard this year. And there was a lot of publicity about this. And what you see in this trial is discussions about who is the victim. So victimhood and who performs victimhood sufficiently is you know, really assessed by the press, by online trolls. There's all these memes developed, a lot of hostile messages about Amber Heard in particular and, and, and women in general, right? Um, and observers question whether or not Amber Heard, because she had claimed to have been a survivor of domestic violence in her relationship with Johnny Depp, whether or not she was telling the truth, because she, she didn't seem to present as the perfect victim. And the truth is, whether it's a 19th century case or a 21st century case, there are no such things as, there's no such thing as a perfect victim. But she is deeply scrutinized as a consequence. Another theme that resonated from that trial for me as a historian of these 19th century scandals is the theme that sometimes wealthy, powerful men are just the targets of manipulative women. And so Johnny Depp was actually framed as a victim in some of the discourse of this trial, that Amber Heard was just with him for the sake of benefiting her career, you know, taking advantage of his wealth. And so he is actually framed as the victim according to some of the accounts and reports. And so as I contend today with my discussion, you know, there is no monolithic sexual culture. Not today, not in the 19th century. We may have do-gooders and moral reformers like puritanical efforts to set up a city on a hill. We might have those 19th century moral reformers trying to save fallen women, whether they want it or not. We have today efforts to try to tell people how to express their gender, what information they are entitled to about contraceptives, what they can do with their body, because other people think that their way is the only way, that there is only one culture that we must observe. And so what I hope you take away from my talk today is that that is historically inaccurate, that there have always been multiple sexual cultures you know, at play, circulating in contestation, and I thank you for listening to my talk.